On this 4th of July, I wanted to briefly discuss some myths, misconcepts, and lack of knowledge about American independence. While there are many things in American history that are hotly debated, forgotten, and misinterpreted, I just wanted to focus on our independence itself. This is in large part due to a poor understanding of the subject matter and American school systems abbreviating large swaths of history into one to two page excerpts. So as not to bore you out of your minds, I'm going to review simply five misconceptions about the American independence. Number five. The 4th of July is when we declared independence. Our actual date of independence has been the subject of some debate for, oh, I don't know, the entirety of our existence as a sovereign nation. And there are a few dates to take into account. So then why specifically is it the 4th that we choose as the day? Well, kinda just because it was the date written on the final draft of the declaration itself. But as some of us who have gone to college know, just because the date on the paper was before it was due doesn't mean you can send it in a week later. The actual legal declaration of independence from Britain was drafted and approved by the Continental Congress on the 2nd of July. This was the day that the Founding Fathers agreed was the official declaration that America was no longer a part of Britain. The 4th was simply the day that the final draft of the declaration to the King was finalized and approved. Now that being said, it took weeks for the final draft to be finished and signed, with some of its members of Congress signing it as late as August. And then they had to actually send the thing to the king, which took months. Now that also being said, I could write on a piece of paper and say, hey, I'm no longer part of this country, and also I'm taking your land and supplies. But you kinda need to back that stuff up. So we fought a war. But wait a minute. The Declaration wasn't a declaration of war. The American Revolution started long before 1776 and ended long after 1776. The British officially surrendered in 1781 at the Battle of Yorktown. But did that mean freedom? Not yet. The Treaty of Paris, which ended the Revolutionary War, was ratified on April 1783, but not even signed until September 1783. So with all these dates in mind, it makes sense that by the 1800s, they settled on the one written in ink next to the words, Declaration of Independence. Number four, America was founded as a Christian nation. While it's true that certain prominent Christian denominations fled from religious persecution to the colonies, the idea was that this would be a place where you could practice your religion free from persecution. Unless you practice witchcraft or were an atheist, as long as you believed in some higher power, you are Gucci. There are four references to God in the Declaration, and none of them denote a Christian God. They are all actually pretty inclusive. Law of nature and nature's God. Endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. To the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. With a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. I can see how the confusion came to be, especially seeing as many of the founders and settlers were Christian. But also, many of the men responsible for our founding documents and constitutions, not the constitution, were also naturalists, deists, and non-denominational. For example, the term nature's god refers to that which is responsible for human and the rest of nature being what it is. It's a way of referring to god as knowable by human reason. In other words, our minds, unassisted by divine revelation, can figure out that there's such a thing as human nature, and that there are laws or rules that we must follow if we are to live justly and well. Reason can see that if we violate those laws, we will suffer such evils as death, slavery, or misery. Basically, that nature's God is simply a way of looking at God as very hands-off, where though he may exist, he is too busy managing nature and human nature to care about what your neighbor is doing. Number three. The line, all men are created equal, is referring to only white males. Beovis covered this briefly in a video he did on gender differences in America a while back, in which he described that, though the original intention of using the term men was to refer to all humankind, even if that's not how it ended up happening. 
After Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration's first draft, he famously wrote that they only retained a quarter of his original text, and then later was included in a series of papers called the Jefferson Papers, where he wrote on that subject saying in his restrictive definition of equality was, people are of equal moral worth, and such deserve equal moral treatment under the law. Which can also lead to some confusion, as Jefferson himself had slaves. And I believe I have the answer to this after reading way too many old documents. The statement that all men are created equal was to intend to represent that all mankind at birth are human beings, by nature's standard. And no man is higher than a human, or should be considered royalty, or in godhood. And that some people, due to the situation they are born, no matter how unfortunate, are subject to their societal surroundings. Disclaimer! This is a piss-poor excuse for slavery. But the intention was to say that we are the same, and that nobody should be considered a king or a god, which is the opposite meaning of what it seems many of us understand that line as. This is probably the point where a lot of you are starting to get mad at me, and that's understandable. Your counter-arguments are completely valid, and I will explain why in number two. The Founding Fathers' views were all aligned and linear. People like to think that the Founders all had one linear line of thinking, and then once the Declaration was written, and the Constitution was ratified, that we followed those rules all the way through. But it was more like this. Each state had their own government, and each state wanted their own freedoms. It was hard to just make chains and just be the greatest country in the world. All they did was lay the foundation. That's why we call them the founders and not the builders. It was supposed to be that they gave us the foundation for a great nation in hopes that future generations could be the builders and carry out those truths that were supposed to be self-evident. But as things tend to go, bias and hate and many other horrible things got in the way. The ideal country would take a couple hundred years to achieve, and we still aren't even there yet. We can dream and hope and pray, but the execution is a lot harder than this tall order. Imagine looking in the mirror and seeing you're out of shape, and writing down, I declare that I shall be thin, and expecting it to just be. Many of the Founding Fathers died not long after the Revolution, and new politicians jumped in and made new laws. The Constitution was supposed to be an ever-changing document that could evolve with the people, so it could maintain and be for the people, and by the people, not a bunch of old dead men. And that's what leads to number one, a fundamental misunderstanding of America itself. The Constitution of the United States came along with ten amendments, which are called the Bill of Rights. The next change wouldn't come until a decade later with the 11th Amendment. Since then, another 16 amendments have been added to the Constitution, changing American life to keep up with changing times. I think the fundamental misunderstanding of America from all sides is that there is some set in stone Ten Commandments, and that this is just the way things are. Which is, by and large, the most un-American thing somebody can think. Progressives tend to want to move forward at the highest levels and don't see the small changes that could lead to big ones. Conservatives tend to hold on to some fantasy that there's a way things used to be and try and stifle change at any given avenue. But one great thing about America, despite all its flaws, and Lord knows there are plenty, it is our ability to change. When I look at the flag, I don't see what America was or is. I see what it stands for. That flag belongs to me and you. And as long as we all work together towards a common goal, we can make anything happen. America isn't the founders. It isn't our ancestors, our laws, our might. It is us. We are America. There is a line in the Declaration of Independence that people don't see because they only read the first sentence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, 
deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles, and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And the rockets, red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave.